But today we're in chapter 21. We're going to look at verses 29 through 33 here in the Gospel of Luke as we continue our study in, in, our, um, in this Gospel. And so let's begin reading together here in Luke chapter 21 at verse 29. I'll read to verse 33 and we'll get into our study. Luke chapter 21 beginning at verse 29. Luke writes, Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Now, as we begin, chapter 21, remember with me, as we've been looking through this chapter, Jesus had prophesied that the Jewish temple would be destroyed. In verse 5 of chapter 21, uh, we, we read, Then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, he said, These things which you see, the things will come uh, the, times, the days will come in which uh, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So Jesus had prophesied that the Jewish temple would be destroyed. And as he had done that, it prompted a question from his apostles. That, that question is, is located in verse 7 when they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And so the entire chapter of 21 actually is Jesus' answer to that one question. And so as we've gone through chapter 1 together, throughout this chapter, Jesus has been giving various signs concerning his return. He had spoken concerning the fact that there would be a period of general troubles that would occur throughout the entire church age, but that there was also a specific time that is referred to by Jesus as a time of tribulation and great tribulation that would occur uh, also at the very end. As a matter of fact, there is going to be a seven-year tribulation that begins with increasing judgments occurring in the, in the first three and a half years, and then the great tribulation would ensue from that point, concluding with Jesus' return. And so Jesus has been speaking concerning these things in answer to the question that had been asked of him. Now, he has made it very clear that what we call the second coming, the second coming is going to be as real as his first coming. And the reality of that, and this is, I think, where the rubber meets the road, the reality of that is if we really believe that Jesus is true to his word, if we really believe that, well, the reality of that would be that my life would be lived in such a way that it reflects that I believe that. A lot of times my theology and my behavior don't really jive. They don't really go together. I, my beliefs and my behaviors sometimes are entirely different. I really do believe that it's possible for us to believe all the right things about the return of Christ and still be unsaved or still be very carnal. And so when we study the Word of God, many times as it relates to the return of Christ, there's a, an exhortation that's attached to his return. I'll give you an example. It's found in, in 1 John in chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Uh, in that passage, when the Apostle John was writing, 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3, he said, Beloved, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as Jesus himself is pure. In other words, the return of Christ is an incentive for living a godly life. When we really believe that Jesus is returning, then we live as if we anticipate that return. It, it makes sense to me. If I really think that he's returning, I'm going to live as if he's going to come. It makes, it makes uh, perfect sense. In Titus chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, the apostle Paul said, God's grace is teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed 
and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Recently, when we had a, a prayer meeting here related to, to the uh, Proposition 8 and all, and as we gathered on Friday, some of you were with us on that Friday night, and um, we shared various, uh, Jack Hibbs and, and uh, Rawl and I shared that night here in, in that prayer meeting. I, I shared a little bit with, with those who were in attendance, and I, I said, you know, it's an interesting thing that we Christians are, are very vocal saying that we need to preserve traditional marriage. When there are statistics, the disturbing statistics that you can find with the study that George Barna did, I think it was in the year 2002, in which it was demonstrated that evangelical Christians have a higher divorce rates than atheists and agnostics. And as I said that, you know, people, it's, fine, it's hard to believe, isn't it? I mean, people who actually say, I believe in traditional marriage aren't keeping their marriages together. And atheists and agnostics are keeping their marriages together. And so I was sharing, listen, if we're going to have an impact in this society, it's going to be the impact of character. It's going to be that we have actually learned that God's commands are truly holy and just, and therefore we ought to keep them because of all people on the face of the earth. We believers ought to be the ones who love the Lord and fear him the most, I would think. And, and that's the whole point. So when the Lord Jesus Christ is, is teaching his disciples concerning his return, well, there's a motivation that ought to cause me to, um, to be anticipating that, and that's the sense that, that when he returns, I'm going to be as he is, and therefore, if I have that hope in me, I'll purify myself even as he is pure. I'm going to live a life that is holy. It's going to be zealous for good works. And, and that's what the proper understanding and study of last days is supposed to produce. It's supposed to produce a people who are expecting Jesus Jesus to return and living every day as if he is. It was asked of us one time in, a, in a, a meeting that I was in, and I've repeated this in my own studies because it spoke so, so much to my own heart. Uh, the, the, the question was asked, if you knew for a fact, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Jesus was going to return, and there's no doubt about it, he is going to return, and you knew the exact time. It's going to be next week at a certain time. If you actually knew that, the question was asked, Exactly what is it that you would do different in your life? Is there anything that you would do differently if you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that within one week Jesus is returning? And, and that question was posed of us. And so naturally, I, I begin to think, what would I do? And then the, the next statement is, then you need to start doing that now. Because that's how you really demonstrate that you expect that the Lord is really returning. But if we're saying, well, the Lord delays his return then in essence, what I am is I'm, I'm not really believing that he is going to come back. So the hope of his coming ought to cause something in me, uh, something called a zeal uh, for holiness that actually changes my life. And so not only do I have proper doctrine, but I also am doing the things that I believe. Not only do I have proper beliefs, but I actually have behavior that accompanies my beliefs. And so that's what it's all about, and that's what Jesus is speaking about. And so Jesus is speaking concerning his return, and here in this passage before us, he gives a parable. It's called the parable of the fig tree. So he's illustrating his answer by using a fig tree. And so notice what he says in verse 9, he's, uh, verse 29 rather, he says, he spoke to them a parable, look at the fig tree and all the trees. Well, as he begins to speak here, he's saying, listen, the signs that I have been speaking about, well, when these signs begin to occur, my coming is very near. And this particular parable is prophetic because it is speaking specifically to the generation in existence just before his return. And he says you're to look at, now notice this, the fig tree. And he actually speaks of the fig tree and, and makes mention of other trees. But look at the fig tree is what he says. And as he uses the fig tree, we need to understand that in Scripture, Israel is often represented by a fig tree. Very often in the Old Testament, for example, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament, the fifth book of the Bible, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, uh, we read, the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey. And so fig trees is part of what represents the nation of Israel. In Hosea, in chapter 9, verse 10, uh, we read, I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. 
So in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is often represented as a fig tree. When Jesus was speaking in the Gospel of Luke, he would, he would use a fig tree on occasion to represent the nation of Israel. Uh, for example, in Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, we saw this already, but Luke writes, he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So I said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. And we saw that as Jesus was given that parable, he was speaking concerning the unbelief of the nation of Israel, a nation that was rejecting its Messiah and was not producing fruit of righteousness. Now, when Jesus was ministering, uh, Matthew records this, uh, Jesus actually, at the end of his ministry, cursed a barren fig tree. In Matthew 21, verse 19, uh, Matthew records, Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. And immediately the tree withered. So we know that that tree symbolized national Israel, a spiritually dead nation. Israel had an impressive outer appearance of religion, but in reality produced no fruit. It was dead. And so that's what Paul would say concerning that nation when he wrote in Romans chapter 10, Verses 1 and 2, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelite is that they, they may be saved. I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. They're not producing any fruit. And so when Jesus here in Luke chapter uh, 21, verse 29, speaks of the fig tree, we know that as he gives this parable, he's speaking concerning the nation of Israel. In verse 30, he says, When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So he's saying they are already budding. The question has to be asked, what does that mean? What are you speaking about, Jesus, when you say, when you see that they are already budding? Well, perhaps what he's referring to or alluding to would be the nation of Israel and in a prophetic sense, the miraculous rebirth of the Jewish nation. Now, all of us, obviously are aware of the fact that Israel was scattered around the world for over 1,900 years. But it miraculously once again came to exist in, in 1948. And so that in and of itself is a miracle. But I want to show you something in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Turn with me, please, to Ezekiel chapter 37. And I want to show you something found in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 37. This is a nation that miraculously came back to life. I've shared this with you so often. All of you are very familiar with this. Read your Old Testament and look at all the different peoples there. Philistines, Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, all the ites, there's so many ites. Uptites, out of sights, cellulites. I like that. That's lots of ites. Israelites. But try and find those people groups now. Look for them and they're not here. They don't exist, of course. They're out of existence now. But we have the Israelites. We have the Jewish nation. And that's a miracle in and of itself. Scattered throughout the world. And yet brought back into one nation in 1948. Well, this is an answer to a prophecy that we find in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 37. Now, we'll look at verses 1 through 14 here because what this records for us is a vision called the vision of the valley of dry bones. Now, just so that you know, Ezekiel, this book was written 586 years before Christ, 586 B.C., and this chapter here, the verses that we're going to be looking at, especially the first 14 verses, this chapter has had, over time, various interpretations. There are those who look at Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14, and view it as presenting what would be called a general picture of resurrection from the dead. 
There are others who would say that this, pa this passage speaks only of Israel's regathering from Babylonian captivity and being brought back into the land of Israel. It's a picture, they would say, of the nation awakening to life once again in the land of Israel. But it relates to the regathering from the Babylonian captivity. There are others who would say that this is simply a picture of a political revival of the nation of Israel but in reality, what this is showing to us is the spiritual condition of Israel during the centuries of its dispersion. It also points to the national resurrection and restoration of Israel to the land. Now, how do we know that? Well, before we read verses uh, 1 through 14, notice verses 21 and 22 because it reveals that to us. It says... Uh, Ezekiel 37, 21 and 22, Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations wherever they have gone and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. So this is quite obvious, a picture of the national resurre resurrection and restoration of Israel to the land. That took place in 1948. But let's read verses 1 through 14 together, and, and I'll give you some, some insight into this as we're considering the parable of the fig tree. Beginning at verse 1, Ezekiel 37, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you. You shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, suddenly a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over. But there was no breath in them. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you. You shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord so this chapter is called the prophecy of the dry bones. We see in verses 1 and 2 that Ezekiel's been brought out in the spirit and set down in a valley full of dry bones. These are bones that are sun-bleached. It's obvious that they have been there for some time. And as he looks at it, it, there is absolutely no life, physical nor spiritual, that he can see. And so as he's looking at this, notice verse 3, God asks the question, Son of man, can these bones live? And so that emphasizes the impossibility and hopelessness of the situation. Can these bones live? We who have gone into the desert, we live, you know, nice and close to desert. We have gone into the desert, and you've seen, you know, skulls from cattle and all that have, you know, the cattle has died and the skeletons left behind. And, and you see that, and the question would come to you, can this live? Well, what's the answer? You know, well, as far as I'm concerned, absolutely not. And that's why Ezekiel answers in the way that he does. He says, oh, Lord, you know. This is beyond my ability to answer. It requires more power than man possesses to make these bones live, is what he's saying. And so he's looking at a valley of dry bones. It's absolute death. There's no life, whether physical or spiritual. And God asks that question, can they live? Only you know, God. It's beyond my power. 
So he says, prophesy, verse 4, prophesy to these bones, say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you, you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, put breath in you, you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So the life-giving word of God is going to accomplish that impossible task, the life-giving word of God. He said, prophesy, because it's the word of God that brings life to that which has no life. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. That's how you and that's how I got saved. We got saved because we heard the word of God. We got saved because somebody proclaimed a message that had life in it. We embraced that message called the gospel, and as a result of that, We were regenerated. We were reborn. We who were walking dead people, zombies, if you will, we who were spiritually dead became alive because of the life-giving word. And so here, as Ezekiel is prophesying and and is speaking, he's basically being told that, that the word of God is going to give life to this nation. I am going to restore this nation. I am the one, he's saying, who will do this, even though it's an impossible task. He's saying, I will bring life to these dead bones. The nation of Israel will once again come to life. And ultimately what will happen is they're going to recognize that God is their Lord. And so Ezekiel obeys him. I prophesied, verse 7, as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them and, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man. Say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. This is a picture, a picture of Israel. Now, the result here as he prophesies over these bones is that they once again are clothed with flesh. But I want you to see it, but they're still dead. That would be a picture of the nation of Israel reassembled, but without spiritual life, which is the way it is right now. I mean, sometimes when we go to Israel, we have people who are first time, first time they go to Israel, who are so excited because they're going to go to the, what is called the Holy Land. At least there are those who call it the Holy Land, but once they get there, they discover it's no holier than any place else. And they enter there and they find that the majority of Jewish people who are living there today, the majority overwhelmingly are, are agnostic, non-practicing. Uh, the Jewish religion doesn't really, really matter that much to them outside of some of the, the holy, uh, holy festival days and all of that. But they're, they're, they don't live overwhelmingly. They don't live uh, under the law. They're not living as believers. It, it, it's, for some, it's actually a great disappointment when they, when they see that. The nation has been reassembled, and in a miraculous fashion, it has come back together, bone to bone, if you will. The flesh has been put on this, but there is no spiritual life in it. The the life has not yet to come. It it reminds me of how that when when God took the ground, as as it's recorded in Genesis, and he took the ground and he formed the dirt into Adam, into man. And it shows that in the original creation of man, the picture there is, is of God working in a very tender way, producing the first human being. But the Bible tells us that, that it was, he was just laying there until God breathed into him the breath of life. The nation of Israel is a, a nation that's been reassembled, as we have seen it since 1948, but it has no spiritual breath within it. It hasn't come to a knowledge of its Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful nation. It's beautiful, but it's without life. And and it will not have life until the Spirit of God enters in. And, And that's what we see now. That's what we have now. The first stage of God's work in Israel. The nation continues to slowly regather, but the nation has no life in it, no spiritual life. And that's what's taking place here. And that's why, ultimately, God is going to breathe life into this nation. You see, after the tribulation, where we've already looked at how how, um, 
the Lord is going to bring that nation through and it's going to refine that nation. After the tribulation, God once again will be their God. That's what's being referred to in verses 11 through 14 here in Ezekiel. When it says, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, cause you to come up from your graves, bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I've opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you. You shall live. I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. That is what's going to take place just prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the tribulation concludes and those have come through the refining fire and have been brought to faith in their Messiah. And that's how that's going to take place. And so what we have right now in the nation of Israel, and you can turn on back to Luke chapter 21, what we have right now in the nation of Israel is it is being reassembled. It continues to be reassembled even as I speak now, but ultimately it will be the nation that once again God is its God. At this moment, that is not true with that nation. And so back in chapter 21 at verse 31, Jesus says, uh, so you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. So the re when the, the nation of Israel regathered and once again became a nation, that should have been for believers a, a sign that, that Jesus' return is approaching. You know, if you, if you like to study the Bible and you go and you buy commentaries, and, and some in this church like to do that, and you buy commentaries and all, and you're doing last day studies. You might find this interesting. If you buy commentaries that were written in the 1800s, 1700s, you know, earlier uh, commentators and all, and there's some very rich things to, to, to learn from some of the early uh, church fathers as they left some of their material behind and all for us. But you read some of that material as it relates to the nation of Israel, and you will see overwhelmingly in the 1800s, early 1900s, overwhelmingly, that when the commentators are referring to things that relate to the nation of Israel in the last days prior to the return of Christ, they overwhelmingly practice something that is called replacement theology. Some of you have heard that term, replacement theology, which simply means that the church has replaced the nation of Israel in the plans of God. And they do not see the nation of Israel as a literal nation any longer, but they spiritualize it. And so things that related to the nation of Israel are now ascribed to the church. And you'll see that in the commentators. And the reason is because some of these early commentators actually traveled to Israel. And they would see that, that it, was, it, was, it was abandoned, that, that there were uh, basically nomadic uh, shepherds, Arabs, who, who lived there. There weren't in, uh, many Jews who were there in the nation and all. And in their mind, it would be impossible, it would be impossible to see this nation under control of national Israel once again. And it even didn't even, it didn't even have the name Israel anymore. I mean, to this day, you can pick up books and you can be reading on Israel. And what's the word that they use? They use the word Palestine. And the reason they use the word Palestine is because the word Palestine is really a uh, transliteration of the word Philistine. And what they're trying to call Israel is the nation of the Philistines. They don't even want you to associate Israel with its own nation. And so that's why even in some of my Bibles, I will have the land of Palestine. Early commentators speak of the land of Palestine. But in reality, it's the nation of Israel. And they couldn't believe, they didn't believe such a thing could happen. They didn't believe that this nation would one day regather and actually exist. And yet what happened is in 1948, the miracle of miracles happened and the nation once again formed, even as Ezekiel 37 made it very clear what happened. One of the strongest arguments for the truthfulness of the Bible is the simple existence of the nation of Israel. That's one of the strongest arguments you have. When people say, how do you know the Word of God is true? How do you know that Bible is true? Well, Jesus spoke concerning the nation of Israel. He spoke concerning it in this condition during just before he returns. And over 1,900 years, it was abandoned. There was no such thing as Israel. It was filled with uh, 
was swamps. When, you, when you're in Israel and you're in the northern portion of Israel and we travel up the highway there on the western coast, and you'll be looking at all of these crops and, you know, they have various trees that they plant and, and it's become the breadbasket, if you will, of Europe in many ways. They produce a lot of oranges and citrus and, and various other things, avocados and all. When you're going through that land, your guide will point out to you that the land that you're driving through right now and all of these fields that you see at one time, all of this, especially in an area called the Hula Valley, all things, the Hula Valley. The first Hawaiian lived there in the Hula Valley. But when you're going through that, they will point out that this actually, this area here was swamp. And what you'll see is eucalyptus trees. They have eucalypt eucalyptus groves everywhere. And he says, you know why you see so many eucalyptus trees? He said, they're not really indigenous to Israel. Actually, they came from Australia. Do you know why there are so many eucalyptus trees up here in the Hula Valley? And so naturally, you're supposed to say, no, tell me, oh, great one, why? Well, the answer is because the eucalyptus thrives on a lot of water. So they threw all these groves in there so it could suck up the water from the, uh, from the swamps. And that's how they were able to drain those swamps and pull out all of that excess water through all these groves of eu eucalyptus trees. And so he's, they, he, they will tell you, when you go into that land, when you originally went in the early 1900s and all, this was abandoned. All of this was. There were, no, there were no trees. This was just swamp land. As a matter of fact, uh, malaria was a very, very um, destructive disease. Many people died of malaria. But because the Jews went in and began to plant plants like that, eucalyptus and all, it changed the entire fabric of that nation. So when you go into the nation of Israel to this day and you see it existing, that's the sign Jesus was giving. And he said, when you see this fig tree beginning to blossom, you know that summer is nigh. You know that my return is near. This was not specifically spoken to his apostles living at that time. This is written for us in the end days to awaken us to the reality of the fact that Jesus' return is any day now. Now he says in verse 32, Assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Now, when he says, I say unto you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place, that word generation is a word that many people argue over. That word generation is a word that can be used at least two different ways. The word generation, one, the word generation uh, can speak of, uh, of natural descent, the successive members of a genealogy. It, it would be speaking of a, a nation of people. And so that would be saying uh, this nation, this Jewish nation as a people will not cease existing. So this generation will by no means pass away is another way of saying that Israel will continue and will not pass away as a people. Jeremiah 31, verse 35 says it like this. This is what the Lord says, he who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the seas so that its waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. If, if the sun stops shining it in the day and if the moon stops reflecting its light at night, only then would Israel ever cease to exist. That's what he's saying here. And obviously, the sun and the moon continue to do what they do. But it also speaks of the people, the people who are alive during the time or the end times who will be viewing these things. And so... You know, I'm not somebody who runs around putting dates, uh, and, and I'm not doing that right now. What I am saying is we have seen the nation of Israel regathered. I believe that that's ample proof that the Lord's return is coming, at least from his own word, is, is coming soon. And that generation, that nation of Israel continues to exist. It didn't cease to exist. It continues to this day. And... Uh, and I fully expect that he's going to return any time now. 
Uh, somebody recently asked me, do you think the Antichrist is alive right now? And uh, my answer is, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. He may be pastoring Calvary Golden Springs for all I know, but <laughs> I don't know for sure. I, I wonder sometimes. But. Now, the answer is no, be, but see, part of the reason, well, the answer is no is because it's obvious that it, it, who knows. But secondly, um, as a Christian, I'm not looking for Antichrist anyway. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. And so I realize he's returning uh, any time. And so what will happen is Israel is going to become a nation, which it did, and that reveals that we're the, at the end of history, but it also reveals that the rapture is about to occur um, the next event on the prophetic calendar, and no other event occurs prior to this next event, the next event on the prophetic ca calendar is the rapture of the church. That's the next event. That's the next thing that's going to happen that fulfills prophecy is the rapture. And that's going to come. It's going to come soon. And I look forward to that. You know, we used to say, here, we used to say, I'll see you later, and then the response would be, here, there, or in the air, you know, and, and that's kind of how we lived at that time when I first got saved. I, I, yes, began to hear about Jesus' return first when I got saved at the age of 20, and yes, it's been 30, almost 38 years that I've been walking with the Lord, and no, he hasn't returned yet, but that simply means that his return is one day closer. Every day I wait, it's one day closer. Every day, one day closer. So again, we ought to live as if we really anticipate that. Now, Finally, when he says in verse 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. He's simply saying this. He's saying the universe ultimately will be done away with. It's going to be recreated after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. You see that in the book of Revelation. But God's word endures forever. God's word is a sure word, and it endures forever. Psalm 100, verse 5 says, The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27. In the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them. They will be discarded, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13, the day of the Lord will come as a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25, all flesh is as grass, the glory of man as a flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower thereof falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is a word that by the gospel is preached unto you. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. It's the word of life. And by embracing this word, as you heard it, as I heard it, as the gospel was preached, my life was transformed, absolutely transformed, uniquely made brand new by the life-changing Word of God. It's through the embracing of God's Word, the living God's Word, the acting on God's Word, the obedience to God's Word, the trusting of God's Word, that our lives are absolutely transformed. God does marvelous things. Marvelous things. Absolutely amazing things. I was standing outside on Sunday and I was talking to a friend of mine. We were talking about how, what God does, how good God is. And, and I said, you know what? All the Lord wants us to do is believe him, just to trust him, just to believe him. And I want you to travel with me for just a moment in your mind's eye for just a second as I was speaking with him. I was out there by the gazebo in your mind's eye. You know where the gazebo is. I was standing by the gazebo out there. And as we were standing there, I said to him, I said, turn around and look at the old building that we used to occupy. And I said, you see that? And he goes, yeah. I said, if we didn't trust the Lord, 
Well, one, to be honest with you, we'd have never even been in that building. But if we didn't trust the Lord, that's where we would be right now, in that building. I said, you see that patio cover there? He goes, yeah, that wouldn't exist. You see that building right over here, that children's wing there? That wouldn't exist. What that would be would be a red barn and three houses. I said, if you turn around and look at the sanctuary right now, I said, look at that. That would be asphalt and dirt because that's all that existed here prior to this building. I said, everything you see on these grounds is an evidence of God working because we trust him to do that. Everything that you see is the hand of God. Everything. And so I believe the Lord. I believe God can do abundantly above all that we ask or think. I know that he can. I have no doubt that he can. But where did I learn that? I learned that from the word of God. And when you study that word and hold fast to that word, God honors his word. And that's why Jesus makes it very clear to us, listen, when you see this take place, you know that summer is nigh. My return is soon. And what do we say? Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We await your return. Come quickly. We want to be with you.